must move on now to questions to the Minister of Health, Social Services and Public Safety. And again, we will start with topical questions. And I call Mr Gerry Kelly. Good uh, and uh, I'd like to ask the Minister, in, in terms of the recent uh, comments by British uh, Care Minister Norman Lamb, that 15 minutes of domiciliary care um, was, uh, in most cases, completely in, in, uh, appropriate, and also the report by Leonard um, Cheshire, which said that short visits simply do not allow enough time to deliver a good quality uh, care. Would the Minister agree that domiciliary care in the north of Ireland then uh, needs to be uh, reviewed, especially when it says that most, uh, it, it relies most heavily on uh, short care visits and it needs an urgent review uh, in terms of the elderly? Especially? Well, short care visits can meet the needs um, of elderly people, but I think that we shouldn't be looking at 15 minutes of care uh, three, four times a day be, be, being uh, some sort of template that everyone has to work off. That can be the case, but it isn't always the case. So, for example, in a single week in September, uh, HSC Trust provided over 250,000 hours of domiciliary care, with an average of 10.4 hours per service user, which would indicate that, that is considerably more uh, than the 15 minutes. I certainly think that for some people, uh, 15 minutes may be suitable uh, because they don't uh, need that level of care, but for many others, it is going to be woefully inadequate, and I think that we can do more on that front. Question uh, uh, on, on Fraglishan. I thank the Minister for his, his answer so far. I'm, I'm not quite sure if he covered this, but I, I think the question was Is the Minister going to do a review of the needs of the elderly uh, in such circumstances, and could he give uh, a breakdown of the percentage of the 15 minutes uh, domiciliary care currently in operation? Well, and, uh, maybe the members are not aware, but last year the Patient and Clan Council. Um, care at Home, Older uh, People's Experience of Dormicillary Care published a report. Uh, they are independent um, of, of uh, the department. And, uh, their findings revealed that levels of satisfaction with quality of care at home was 87 per cent, uh, with people rating care as good or very good. I am concerned about the 13 per cent, because it is good that 87 per cent think it is good or very good, uh, but let us see where the other 13 per cent is failing. So whether we need to actually um, carry out a review. Um, or whether we look at, at how we can best meet the needs of people, including uh, encouraging more people to take up the offer um, of direct finance, where they can choose their own time uh, and the, the hours that people come in, uh, there is a course of work to be done. Thank you. I call Mr Cahill Boylan. Uh, can the Minister provide a timeline for the new suicide prevention strategy? Well, the suicide prevention strategy is a course of work that, that we have been looking at, and we have made good progress. And we had a very significant um, uh, uh, conference uh, l l last year in Belfast, uh, which gives us good information to work off. So that's a course of work that we'll continue to do, uh, and I think that it's important uh, that we continue to keep a focus on suicide because 300 suicides per year uh, is far too many. Uh, we didn't accept it during the Troubles. We wouldn't accept it on our roads. So why should we accept it uh, with people taking their own lives? Could I thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and also thank the Minister for his answer. But could I ask the Minister how can he justify a current tender pro uh, process um, in the absence of a strategy? Well, obviously, there is ongoing work, and we spend around uh, just over £7 million per year on suicide prevention. So, we have organisations like Lifeline, uh, who provide 24-7 uh, helpline service uh, for members of the community. And I should say that we have had experts over in Northern Ireland looking at the work that we are doing on suicide, and they would indicate that, on a worldwide basis, that it is cutting edge. It could be much worse. Uh, unfortunately, the 300 is far too high, but it could be much worse. And much of the work that has been done has reduced the levels of suicide that might otherwise have happened in Northern Ireland. And that, that is something that, that, that we should look at. I call Mr. Fran McCann. Uh, following the recent Assembly debate on child sex, sexual exploitation, can the Minister outline the terms of reference for the inquiry? Well, I, I haven't got. Um, a reference date, uh, or I haven't got the, the, the terms of reference uh, as yet. That is something that we are working on, 
and hopefully over the course of the next, uh, next few days, um, certainly the next couple of weeks, we will get to that point and I've indicated that I will bring it back to the House uh, uh, in the form of a statement. I call Fran McCann for something. Uh, can the Minister say how the independent panel will be selected? Well, I have people um, who are currently scarring for, for suitable persons or per, person or persons uh, to carry out this work, and I think the independence of it uh, must be absolutely critical. Child sex abuse is uh, a vile thing. It is an awful thing. And I would simply say to people to put themselves in the victim of, of um, abuse, even just for 24 hours, equally Turning a blind eye to abuse is never right. It's a heartless thing to do, and it's a sickening thing to do. So where there is evidence of failing, whether it be in residential care or whether it be in people's own homes, it is incumbent, incumbent upon us to ensure that we tell the police, the social services of child abuse that's taken place. It's incumbent upon us to cooperate uh, with those services, and the public shouldn't be in any doubt that failure to report child abuse is something that there should be zero tolerance of it. Yeah. And that's why I met the Chief Constable yesterday to indicate that they hadn't done their job as well as they should have in terms of taking the message to the public that there is zero tolerance for child abuse and there is zero tolerance for those who cover up child abuse. I am wholly opposed to any individual who would cover up child abuse. It is wrong, and it was wrong in Cardinal Daly's instance. And I note that many of the member's colleagues uh, made comment when it was referenced to Cardinal Daly. I would challenge Martina Anderson, Martin McGuinness, Sue Ramsey and others who called for the Cardinal to go to step up to the mark today. Call Mr Basil McRae. Uh, thank you, Principal Dancer, uh, Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister for Health uh, tell us if he has any knowledge if the Belfast Trust has recruited cover for the two sexual health consultants currently on maternity leave and if this has had any impact on waiting times? Well, thank the Member for the question. One applicant did attend the uh, interview and uh, was offered a post as a locum for, for the new position. And they are expected to start at the beginning of September. Um, Unfortunately, they declined the offer as they were offered um, a post in the south of England, and the Trust put the post back out to add in May. Unfortunately, there were no applications. So all the clinics are currently being delivered by the consultant in post who is taking on additional activity. Um, there are currently four full-time consultants at the Belfast Trust and one part-time at the South Eastern Trust. And uh, RKIA has recently undertaken a review of specialist sexual health services in Northern Ireland, and that's due to be published in the near future. Mr. Basil McRae for a supplementary. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Uh, could the Minister tell me if he has sought any specific advice on the impact of the general lack of investment in sexual health and sexually transmitted disease, and whether uh, this is because he has a personal moral stance on the issue? Yeah, I have a personal moral stance on the issue, and that is that if people are ill, they need help. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, I think, uh, uh, something that we should all take uh, responsibility for, irrespective of someone's sexuality, uh, their colour, creed, or religion. Healthcare in Northern Ireland is free at the point of need, and I'm proud of that moral stance, uh, by the way. In terms of sexual health, I think it is something that it is really important that we look at and that we address. Uh, I welcome the fact that RQIA are carrying out the work that they're doing, and I think it is a report that we should uh, pay attention to. I think that there are opportunities for us to have a better sexual health service, including uh, pregnancy advice and so forth. There may be opportunities to bring those services together and do it in a more efficient way, um, and there may be opportunities to do it in a less stigmatised way. So I'm happy to look at all of those issues. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Thank you. I'm calling Mr. Michael Majimsi. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, would the Minister join with me in praising those uh, social services staff who have the responsibility for supporting our children, not least those children who are victims of uh, sexual exploitation? 
uh, uh, and will he uh, give the, those social services staff the support that they require? Well, I thank the member for the question, and, and he is absolutely right, uh, because many people who work in social services are put in extremely difficult circumstances, in extremely difficult situations, and uh, they do their best, and they don't always get it right, uh, but they do their best, and I think that it's important uh, that people always do their best, and that's why I think it is incumbent upon all of us to ensure and to drive and to not allow these things to pass under our notice without doing our best. And we should always ensure that children, which are our most valuable resource, receive the protection, the care, the support and the help that they need in the issues that are very prevalent at the minute. I'd have to say that Anya Adams was let down by the RUC. She was let down by her uncle, Jerry Adams, and she has been let down to some extent by the PSNI. I welcome the fact that there was conviction in that case and the good work that was carried out by the PSNI and indeed the Public Prosecution Service in uh, bringing Liam Adams to justice. But I do think that when it comes to the other issue of the cover-up of the crime, that the PS and I have questions to answer, and they need to have those questions done, answered in a very public way. That's why I believe the Ombudsman needs to look at the work of the PS and I debate. It's a very, very unusual set of circumstances, and I think that the PS and I should be asking for the Ombudsman to look at their work, and if they don't, I will, and I will be looking for independence to be applied in this case so that no one, and I mean no one in the public, has any sense that anybody is above the law. Because I don't care if order, it's a man on the street, order, if it's a order, minister, or it's a president, you're order. not above the law. Can I remind the minister that the question was about support for care workers, and you're completely and absolutely off the topic. I call Michael McGimsey for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, bearing in mind uh, that uh, the issue is a criminal offence, and it is, I'm sure the Minister will agree, an issue that this House must be resolute on, but also in terms of cross-border cooperation, in terms of health, an issue that we would expect Doyle Aaron also to be resolute upon, so that the two of us can be presenting a, a, a common approach uh, to this dreadful crime. And is it not uh, unfortunate uh, that the developments uh, south of the border would indicate or would appear to call into question uh, that House's resolution in terms of dealing with this issue uh, in partnership with ourselves. I would welcome the cooperation that we have had with uh, the Republic of Ireland on um, child sexual crime in, in, in recent times. And, uh, we did have a, a major conference in Armagh dealing with this issue. And I think that I uh, would want to ensure that there is maximum cooperation uh, between the Republic of Ireland and ourselves uh, on this, because borders shouldn't stand in the way of protecting children, uh, nor indeed should walls stand in the way of protecting children. And uh, we must all stand together in the fight against those who would seek to cause harm to our children and our young people. Uh, so whether they're in care homes, uh, whether it's in schools, uh, whether it's outside of those schools or care homes, or whether it's indeed in their own homes, we need to ensure that we stand against these individuals. It is known, uh, and social services uh, will bear this out, that individuals who act against a child seldom do it on one child. Uh, there is qualitative evidence uh, which would indicate that they will do it in multiples of cases perhaps 75 times. So to know that someone would be abusing a child and not do anything about it is leaving many, many other children uh, to be the subject of that abuse. Order, and that, uh, that's the end of the period for topical questions. We'll now move on to those oral questions that have been listed for the Minister. I will call Mr Declan McAleer. Um, Keister Abraham, question one. Thank you, 
remember for the question, if we can find it, <laughs> find it here. My apologies, Mr. Deputy Speaker. We got it there next time. Uh, a key objective for my department and for health and social care organisations is to live within available resources, whilst also ensuring that services are delivered in a safe, sustainable and effective way. In this context, health and social care trusts are currently progressing work to assess the pressures that they are facing, so proposals can be agreed which will enable each trust to achieve financial break-even in 2013-14. The trust plans are currently in draft form as there continues to be focused and purposeful engagement between my department, the Health and Social Care Board, and each individual trust. Once agreement has been reached, the plans will be finalised for my consideration. Thanks so much. Michael here for the supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Can the Minister com uh, confirm um, what are the exact amount of savings to be found across all of the trusts and that this uh, will be impact assessed? Well, certainly, uh, as we look at this, uh, Northern Ireland has managed to live within its means in healthcare um, over the course of the last number of years, and that is something that we will seek to continue to do. Uh, many of the things uh, that were being proposed are things that I wouldn't find acceptable, uh, so that is something that we will be given consideration to. I continue to be in uh, discussions uh, with the Finance Minister in relation to monitoring rounds, but nobody should be under any doubt um, that we are under considerable pressure in terms of health and social care in meeting the public expectations uh, within the budgets that we have. Uh, transforming your care will help the situation, uh, but that is something that is going to take time to roll out. Uh, and therefore, we need to continue uh, to carry out uh, necessary works uh, to ensure that we get to the point uh, where we can uh, live within our means. I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And further to the question regarding the Western Health and Social Care Trust on the savings. Would the Minister appreciate that there is a very unique situation within the area in the North West and they have increased costs due to the high proportion of agency and locum staff as they are unable to attract consultants and retain consultants in the North West? Could the Minister give us a view on how that, that, that is appreciated and acknowledged in the context of a very unique and considerable position to be in? Well, the Western Trust has, has many consultants who have been with them for a very long period of time, but I do accept that, uh, and particularly in some services, it can be more challenging. And whenever jobs are offered in the Greater Belfast area, uh, many consultants will take up those opportunities. Uh, I do think that uh, we need to be ensuring that, that we can provide the level of service. So, for example, I know that the Western Trust would, would desire another consultant, at least another consultant, in the um, emergency departments. Uh, that's, that is something that, that I would see of being significant benefit. And one of the reasons that we were looking at the potential link up with the Causeway Hospital was perhaps to, to make a more attractive um, proposition for consultants across those two sites. Uh, to enable them to have the skill-based quality of life that, that, that they could enjoy uh, in a very nice part of the world, um, but also maximise um, their skills in terms of what the hospitals uh, had to do and, and, and had to offer. So uh, I think it's a course of work that we just have to continue to, to do. Uh, obviously, many people desire to live in the, uh, in the North West, um, so we need to provide health care for, for those people uh, in an appropriate way, and that's what we'll continue to, to, to do. I call Mr Roy Beggs. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Um, the original question asks about savings that the trusts are making, but would the Minister accept that when health service staff are advising vulnerable families that their respite care is being cut in half, that they, it is clearly cuts that are being made and short-term cuts which will endanger the health and well-being and even the stability of some families who are caring 24-7? Yeah, I'm not sure whether the member was, was listening earlier on or, or paying attention earlier on, but it clearly uh, was the case that we're providing more dormitory care uh, and more support for, for people uh, than before. Um, I would be very concerned that if, if people are needing that care and they're being told they're not getting it, 
uh, and would encourage anybody who has issues on that front to, and any members to raise that um, with the Trust and to challenge them uh, and ensure that they do meet people's needs. That's what MLAs are there for, uh, to support their constituents in these times. Uh, and if there is a case, then the member needs to make that very clear to the Trust that it's not acceptable. Mr. Peter Weir. <coughs> Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, um, if I can ask the Minister to outline the background to how these contingency plans uh, from the Trusts, uh, how they've emerged. Well, uh, in terms of that, obviously we have the finances uh, and, and the Trusts are, are made aware of, of what savings uh, that they have to put in place. And they, uh, at the end of, of, of uh, the fourth month, in response to emerging overall financial position, uh, the Health and Social Care Board requested all Trusts to provide contingency plans to include a detailed build-up of the factors leading to any projected deficit, and also to detail trust proposals to break even, including potential impact and performance targets. And those were received in late August in what the original questioner referred to. So the Health and Social Care Board and departmental staff reviewed these plans, noted a wide range of proposals that would be considered high risk with regard to achievability, and also would have a, you know, a significant impact on performance and service resilience. The HSCB's conclusion and ours was that these plans were unacceptable as they would create service continuity concerns and impact on waiting lists and times for elective care and social care. And trusts were therefore asked to submit revised contingency plans on 27th of September. And these are currently undergoing scrutiny by the department and the HSCB colleagues. So people needn't get too perplexed about these plans as yet because uh, I don't intend uh, to have our services diminished. Before we move on, uh, can I just notify members that questions 3, 8 and 9 have been withdrawn and I call Mr Dominic Bradley. Question number 2. I set out my intentions in response to contributions to the debate on the 28th of May, again in response to Mr Kelly's question of the 17th of June and they have not changed. I'll continue to use all the options available to me including the independent sector, to drive down waiting lists and provide the best possible care for all our citizens. I will not introduce legislation that would prevent me from responding in a flexible manner to any health care issues that may arise. Transforming your care sets out a compelling case for changes to our health and social care system, and that has been widely accepted by those who work in the sector and by the communities they serve. We need to make changes required to improve patient experience and care and we need to do it in a transparent and a sensitive way, and I remain committed to do so. Thank you. And I call Mr Dominic Bradley. I thank the Minister for his answer, but can I ask the Minister if he has taken any advice from colleagues in other regions of the UK where privatisation has been introduced? Uh, given that it has generally been considered to have been a failure there? Well, you see, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, the, the member and myself are, are on the same sheet uh, with no intention of privatising the health service. On occasions, we may use private services. Um, and I suppose all of you will have used a general practitioner uh, in, in your time. But general practitioners are, are private providers of health care services. There's no drive to, to actually change that or, or to do away with it. And, uh, you know, I, I've often said, you know, whenever I recall um, older people um, lying in, in, in the long wards in the Royal Victoria Hospital and elsewhere um, for geriatric care and what's been offered to them in nursing homes today, in private nursing homes, that's a considerably better place. Yes. So the private sector has a role. But let me be absolutely and abundantly clear on this. The principle of the health service is that it is free at the point of need to everyone who needs it, so no matter how rich you are or how poor you are, you can get that. Let's ensure that that will remain to be the case by ensuring that we have an efficient and a flexible service that can respond to the demands and needs of the public and ensure that we can live within our means. And that is what is most important here, that we continue to uphold that principle that health care, health care service is free at the point of need, something I'm wholly committed to. Yeah, yeah. Mr Gordon Dunn. 
Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers here today. Can the Minister outline the costs if the Department took over full responsibility for health and care services currently provided by independent practitioners? Well, in terms of the provision of social care, 48% uh, of all spending is within the independent and the voluntary sector. The provision of residential and nursing care home services in Northern Ireland, the vast majority is independent and voluntary sector. An assessment and treatment for elective care in the independent sector, uh, what's through targeting of additional funding in recent years. Uh, we've made a significant reduction in waiting lists and waiting times. In doing that, we've spent around £53.7 million with independent sector providers which allowed us to procure some 71,000 assessments and treatments. So, you know, am I not to actually have reduced waiting times, or was I to allow waiting times um, to creep up? So it's about actually making sensible and rational decisions uh, that will ensure that we're able to provide good quality care to the public who need it. Move on. Ms Rosalie McCorley is not in her place. I call Mr Adrian McCullen. Question five, Mr Deputy Speaker. Occupational therapists use a variety of activities and equipment, uh, for example, specialist seating and wheelchairs and adaptions to enable recovery after illnesses or injury and to support independent living and health. A number of actions have been taken forward over the last few years to improve the services provided to the community by occupational therapists, including introduction of direct access to the service, that is access to community occupational therapy, that has now been simplified so that patients and families can self-refer to community OT, as well as being referred by health and, and care uh, professionals. We have now developed standardised access criteria across Northern Ireland to ensure there is a consistent approach across uh, all trusts. And the commissioning plan direction for 2013-14 includes a performance standard that from April 2013 no patient will wait longer than nine weeks from referral to commencement of AHP treatment. I look to the Health and Social Care Board, working with the Health and Social Care Trust, to ensure delivery against this standard, and where that is not the case, to ensure that action is taken to bring performance back in line with the standard as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mr Adrian McCullen for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the, the Minister for his answer? You mentioned nine weeks in his answer. Is that the recommended timescale for completion from the occupational therapy assessments in relation to the disabled facilities? Well, the nine-week performance access standard for all patients uh, being referred to community OT um, is something that we have introduced um, progressively, uh, moving times initially from some 26 weeks which is an intolerable period of time, uh, down to 13 weeks, and this is actually now nine weeks. So the target includes those who are referred to community occupational therapy because they wish to apply for <coughs> disabled facilities grants. And the disabled facilities grants, of course, is something very important to people who have had a massive trauma in their lives, um, and, and, uh, such as a stroke um, or indeed a, a, another traumatic experience. Uh, that has caused them to have to have those adaptions carried out quickly. Uh, so that is for the, the OT uh, referral to be made, and then they will carry out their actions as quickly thereafter uh, to ensure that the, the people receive the services that they so much need. Thank you, Mr. Michael Copeland. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Uh, Minister, several times during your previous answers, you made reference to domiciliary care and the changes that that, will, that that will bring. Would you agree with me that it also must uh, cause us to re-examine the role and revitalise the role of re-enabling occupational therapists? And could you advise how many additional occupational therapists have been employed since you became Minister? Well, re-enablement is something that is absolutely critical. And we want to ensure that people um, who, for example, have had a fall, an elderly person who has had a fall, it was far too easy for those people to end up in, in a residential care home previously. And reablement will very often get those people back on their feet and allow them to resume uh, a normal life again. And it may be that the introduction of some adaptions to a household can make all of the difference um, for, for, for someone like that. So it's absolutely essential that we have um, the appropriate uh, occupational health response. And that is why we have set out to challenge uh, the, 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 the time wait that, that previously took place. I think all MLAs will have come across this, uh, that you know, 
someone w w was needing the adaptions made, uh, but they were, they, they were being confined and weren't, weren't able to do it. And that's why we set out uh, to reduce the 26-week wait uh, to nine weeks. Um, I greatly appreciate the support that I have received from occupational therapists in achieving it. And uh, I work very closely uh, with the AHP services and indeed the, the, the bodies that represent them in identifying uh, their needs for the numbers of occupational ther therapists that are appropriate. Mr. Loris Kelly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I have to declare an interest as a former occupational therapist. Um, Minister, w w would you commit uh, to, make a uh, to make a statement to the House in relation to occupational therapy services, in particular uh, in perhaps the new year, uh, and outline uh, how this target has been reached, whether or not there is any further investment uh, to go to occupational therapy, and give particular reference to the child development clinics, where there is substantial uh, waiting time between the time of initial uh, uh, meeting with an occupational therapist and treatment commencing? Certainly uh, one of the, the early things that happened in, in whenever I became health minister w was meeting a number of people who were allied health professionals who were indicating the sort of services that they could provide and it immediately struck me that here we have services that um, can actually make a really major impact um, on people's lives. And perhaps reduce their need for going to hospital, their need to see doctors, their need to see consultants. So I actually think allied health professionals right across the range provide excellent value for money. Uh, and that's why we've produced a, an allied health professional strategy. And I believe that that will lead to improved care as um, the trusts start to implement that strategy. And it's something that certainly we should be applying pressure on to ensure that the trusts do implement the strategy um, as fully as is practical in each area. Call Mr. McGee Brady. Chair Severus, share question six. In my statement to the House on the 19th of March 2013, I advised members of the outcome of the consultation exercise on the proposals contained in transforming your care vision to action and confirmed there would be no major service change without further specific consultation where appropriate. The HSCB led consultation on the criteria against which statutory residential homes will be evaluated as planned to take place between October 2013 and March 2014. The views of residents and their families will be central in the consideration of the future role of statutory residential homes for older people. There will be a further period of public consultation once trusts have accessed uh, statutory uh, residential care provision against the final agreed criteria. And I call Mickey Brady for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. Following the chaos uh, that ensued earlier in the year uh, with announcements from the trusts about residential care homes, can the Minister assure us that he will ensure this does not happen again? What am I got? Well, <laughs> it's, it's very much in my interest to ensure that it doesn't happen again. Um, and uh, certainly, whenever I heard that there was a proposal to crawl close all of the, the residential care homes, uh, it came as a surprise to me. Uh, however, uh, I have consistently argued that people uh, are in residential care homes because there has been a needs assessment, and that needs assessment has identified that they um, need some form of, of support and care, and that's how they have arrived uh, in a residential care home. Uh, so I don't think that it's appropriate that you look at a facility. I think it's appropriate that you look at the individual within the facility and that you support their needs. And if their needs are best supported uh, within a residential care home that they're living in, um, then that's what we should seek to do and seek to support them in the residential care home where they're currently living. I call Mr. Ian McRae. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. And the Minister will certainly be aware of, of my views in, in respect of Westland um, residential home, but in respect of the wider um, residential provision, um, can the Minister outline what um, other parts of the United Kingdom are doing in respect of this? In, in terms of, of the, the trusts and, and, and their, their um, policies at, at the minute, uh, we would see that um, there's a different perspective between existing residents and the broader population. Uh, so in considering the issue, we need to separate out the group of individuals who are currently in care homes. And they're very content in those homes, and the broader number who tell us that the consultation after consultation 
um, that it is uh, not the type of care that, that they want and they want to be with their families. However, all those who are currently in care homes want to remain in those care homes, and we need to respect their wishes. So, calls to permit admissions to all homes overestimate the demand for new admissions in these homes. In the entire western area, for example, throughout what say admissions uh, still freely occur, only 17 people were admitted to statutory homes over the 2012-13 year. That's around a fifth of the older people who were placed uh, with independent care homes, uh, which was around 80 per cent. So even with some trusts uh, not taking new admissions, there is a, a lot of capacity um, across the sectors. And the new model of provision is not something to peculiar to Northern Ireland. Uh, indeed, Northern Ireland has more statutory provision than the rest of the UK. So in England, for example, um, people aged over 65 cared for in residential homes that accounted for around 8.3 per cent. In Scotland, it accounts for 11.7 per cent. Uh, and no comparable data is available for Wales um, in adult care homes or, or, or placement homes in, in local authorities. Thank you, Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. But the Minister has refused to comment on the non-admission policy to statutory residential homes in some trusts such as the NHSCT. But does he not agree that continuing a non-admission policy makes the new consultation process meaningless? And we seem to be having closure by stealth and after the public for all last time round that really there's actually no change. That at the conclusion of the public consultation that, that has been engaged in, that they decide to uh, remove that. That, that, that is something uh, that people can discuss uh, during the process. But I should uh, remind the member that we are in a transitional period, and we want to get to the point where, uh, as people grow uh, uh, older and require more care, that we provide more of that support in their own home. Uh, that we provide more of that support in supported living facilities where people can have uh, more independence. And in doing that, that will mean a, 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 some reduction in terms of the residential care that's provided. Uh, but where residential care is necessary, then that is something uh, that we need to ensure is available um, for our elderly population. And they must always be treated with respect. Yes. Thank you. Mr. John Dallet. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I have listened very carefully to the Minister and I am encouraged by what he has said, but he will understand that there is a, a very emotive history of evictions and things like that. So, for the record, perhaps for the last time, could the Minister give this House a guarantee that no elderly person will be forced from their present residential home into somewhere else that they do not wish to go? Uh, it is not my intention to evict any elderly person um, from residential um, care that, that, that are currently in residential care. I want to ensure that all elderly people are treated with dignity and with respect and that they are treated uh, as adults in terms of the decision-making process and that people are not talking down to them. Uh, I think that we all have a vested interest in ensuring that we take care of the elderly um, because all being well. Uh, we will make it to the elderly ourselves some day, and we will want to be treated with the respect that I have just outlined. Thank you. I call Mr Jim Allister. Question 7. My Stoops Clinic in Belfast was registered by the Regulation and Quality Improvement Authority on 5 July 2013 in accordance with the provisions of the Health and Personal Social Services Quality Improvement and Regulation Northern Ireland Order 2003 and related regulations. Having been registered, Mary Stubbs International Clinic, Belfast, is subject to a minimum of one inspection per year by RQIA, in common with RQIA's procedures. Additional inspections would be carried out if issues of concern were identified from an inspection. RQIA requires the clinic to have a written statement of purpose and patient's guide, and to have arrangements for regular reviews of these documents. Inspection prior to registration and annually is against the Independent Health Care Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2005. The regulations cover the care and welfare of patients, the numbers, qualifications and experience of staff, and their fitness to perform their work, professional practice, records, staff views, complaints, fitness of premises, financial viability and notifications of events. 
Inspection also covers areas such as the nature of the built environment, record keeping, employment and regulatory arrangements for staff, and the procurement, storage and dispensing of medicine. Mr. Jim Allister for a supplementary. So one year on, is it the case that given the limitation of RQIA's role, that neither the Minister nor the Assembly can know how many abortions have been carried out in the clinic, how many people have been referred for late abortions to GB, how much money this uh, agency has made out of the killing of the unborn, and would the Minister agree that if we had true accountability, then we would know the answer to those, and that it is a shame that the pro-abortion minority in this House uh, have allowed this situation to continue? It's for the Minister to decide, but supplementary question, it's a singular question that we're supposed to deal with. Well, I've raised a number of issues with officials around having statutory assurance that the law is being adhered to and that the RQIA is fulfilling its statutory duties. So my officials are engaging with RQIA on this matter, and I want to have the maximum assurance, and there are a range of powers um, that I'm looking at. Uh, I should say that the Justice Minister, because as the member very well knows this, uh, is currently dealt with under the criminal law. Uh, the Justice Minister indicated to this House that he would bring a paper to the Executive on ensuring the law on abortion is upheld. Uh, I look forward to seeing that document. Uh, and uh, would uh, want that that uh, document be delivered uh, to the executive at the earliest possible opportunity, uh, because we did, and many of us did, rightly oppose the fact that we had an organisation um, that was carrying out these services uh, and had the ability to carry out these services in an unregulated way, uh, and that's something which I regard as wholly uh, unsatisfactory. Mr. Jim Wells, for a supplementary question. <clears throat> Could the Minister give us an update on the consultation on the term termination of pregnancy guidance? Well, uh, clearly I took that matter to the Executive. Uh, we uh, haven't got the details back as yet in terms of uh, what the responses are. Um, I regard um, abortion as, as termination of pregnancy as a very sensitive issue uh, for some people. Having uh, to have a termination of pregnancy is, is the worst thing possible for them, and they are put into desperately difficult circumstances where they, they want to have a child, and uh, for uh, re some reasons, uh, on occasions, uh, they have to have a termination of pregnancy, and, and that is a devastating thing to happen uh, to a couple who are expecting. Uh, for others, they think that termination of pregnancy is, is something uh, that they can use as a contraception, and that is uh, not what we are about in Northern Ireland, and that's not what we should ever be about in Northern Ireland. Uh, there are many means of contraception. The termination of pregnancy should never be that means. And I read in one of the papers, and I, I hope that it's not accurate, uh, but that they believe that the law in England allows for termination on a gender basis. I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, that when I was privileged to have my children. I was glad of every one of them, irrespective of whether they were a boy or a girl. And I just think it is so despicable that that could ever be the case. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'll wholly resist that ever happening in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Call Mr. Alvin McGuinness. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his interesting answers. Uh, could the Minister explain uh, why there is such a, a delay? in proposals coming from the Department of Justice in relation to this issue? Because it seems to me that that is at the heart of this matter. Oh, well, I, I can't speak for the Justice Minister um, or his department, uh, but I will assure the Assembly that I will fully cooperate with the Justice Minister uh, in seeking to bring forward um, regulation that will ensure that the law as it stands in Northern Ireland is upheld, whether it's in the Murray Stoops Clinic or, or anywhere else. And I think that's very important that if we have law um, that is applied fairly, it is applied appropriately uh, and consistently, um, irrespective uh, of, of where people happen to be receiving treatment. Order, and that's time is up for questions to the Minister. Item five.